Hello and welcome back to uh, Airbus uh, What's It Doing Now and today's video is going to be all about the uh, Hudson uh, incident back in 2009 uh, concerning the US Airways flight 1549. Um, you know about this, I did a heads up of it recently just to let you know that it was uh, coming. I've got the full uh, report here and uh, all of my uh, scribbles and uh, scrawls uh, in this. I'll move this microphone out of the way, it's getting a little bit intrusive. Hopefully you can still hear me okay. Um, yeah, and there's there's a lot of it. And the great thing about this uh, incident, of course, is that everybody survived. So there's a lot of data in here, uh, which is really useful uh, to us uh, going, uh, going forward. Um, so I initially said that this would be probably four or five videos. Look, I think actually reviewing this again, it might be more than that. But at the end of the day, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. It doesn't matter if it takes a dozen videos, really. You can pick this up and drop it whenever you want. I think the really important thing is, is that we get as much out of it as, as possible. And there's a great deal of data here, um, which um, is, is, is super useful. Um, not, not just the technical side of things, but it's just how this crew interacted um, we got, you know, particularly when you think about the experience of the first officer, which was quite wealthy, but his limited time actually on type. And when they went through this six minute um, uh, ditching, uh, what they had to get through and how they worked together was a large part of the success of the, of the success of the outcome. Uh, of the incident, as well, of course, the wonderful protections um, of the Airbus 320, the Airbus family. Um, a lot of that recovered uh, by what the crew actually did. But anyway, without giving too much away, let's let's look at what we're actually going to cover here. So I'm going to lead with the crew because uh, I think that's important. And then I'm going to look at some factual information. So we'll look at the history of the flight, the injuries, the persons of which, you know, there, there were very little because everybody survived. Um, damage to the aircraft. We're then going to take a look at the airplane general information. So airspeeds and displays, but more, I think, uh, importantly, the flight envelope protections. We know what they are. You guys know this. We've, we've covered flight protections and flight control laws in different configurations some while ago. If you haven't, obviously, it'd be worthwhile going back over that. But what this report does is it highlights the importance of just how much of a significant role those protections played in the successful outcome of the event. Low speed warnings, electrical and hydraulic systems, were they available? Um, what enabled them to keep the aircraft in normal or what enabled them to actually get flaps out? Um, that's a, a really good uh, area uh, to highlight, just to remind ourselves of some of the tech behind it. The engines, of course, Airframe ditching, uh, emergency landing config, uh, certification requirements. That's we're not going to go into that in a huge amount of detail. That's a little bit out of scope of what we're trying to achieve. We will look at the flight data recorder, the cockpit voice recorder, and the FDR wreckage and impact information, structural damage, um, but actually. Uh, more importantly, I think engine damage, uh, particularly when it talks about um, the uh, ingestion of the birds and what they found and the location of the birds and the sheer size of them. I mean, these were uh, seven to eight pound male and female Canadian geese. And when we talk about engine certification, it's way beyond what was required to certify the engines. Anyway, more of that uh, in, you have to forgive me as I get a little bit excited when I'm talking about things having read the report. Uh, flight, uh, Pre-flight briefing requirements, again, because everybody survived this incident, they can interview the passengers. You'd be amazed, well, you might not be amazed actually, how little uh, information that the, the passengers actually take on board, how, many, how few of them actually listen uh, to the briefing and actually how uh, few passengers actually even grabbed life jackets, even though they were, they were Ditching. I mean, the water was flooding at the back of the aircraft, so in no uncertain terms, they were in the drink. Anyway, some, some, some really important stuff there. But also, uh, as I mentioned in the heads up, the evacuation of passengers and crew members, occupant 
uh, evacuation exit usage. This was a real eye opener. They didn't actually go, the large majority didn't actually go out of the exits that were closer to them. Some actually went out and came back in again. Um, Anyway, we'll, we'll take a look at that aeroplane performance study. The Airbus uh, simulation studies were done by, by crews about the possibility of the aircraft either returning to LaGuardia or going out to uh, other airfields that were um, in proximity, not necessarily in range, careful what you say there. Um, and the what the crews did when they knew about the event, where they could go, and when they built in a sort of a 30-second uh, um startle factor so it's some, some important criteria uh, to, to look at there operational guidance um the dual engine failure checklist part one two and three we'll, we'll take a look at, at that and the differences with the low altitude dual engine failure where the crew actually got to in that checklist uh, which was not very far given the limited time that they had and what was missing essentially um yeah so that's what we got and then finally we'll go on to the analysis uh general analysis engine analysis uh ingestions of the birds um the problem solving and decision making as to what they saw uh for the m1s and the n2s the flight crew performance their decision to use that checklist uh, the decision to ditch on the hudson river probably the longest and flattest uh runway they had available to them at the time uh, descent and ditching airspeed, decision to use flap two for ditching, that's an important one, and the CRM and threat error management during the accident sequence, which is quite honestly um, phenomenal. Then we look at pilot training, uh, and then I think that's probably it. And then we go on to the conclusion, which is the NTSB findings, probable cause, and then the safety uh, recommendations and then depends on how it goes we might look at the BEA uh, recommendations as well and their comments um, actually on the uh, on the event right you'll have to excuse me if you hear me with the paper uh, rattling around here I, I, I wanted to read it from here rather than reading it from the screen because I've got all my notes here uh, so just forgive me if I uh, if I make a bit of a uh, uh, rustling noise Okay, so before we go on to the uh, first part of it, which is basically a summary uh, of the event, I'm just going to introduce you to uh, the crew, right, the captain, um, ex-military, F-4 uh, Phantom, as his previous experience, he was in the uh, US uh, Air Force, commercially, Airbus 320, 737, DC-9, um, Learjet, uh, 146, approximately 20,000 hours and about 8,900 hours as a pilot in command was Captain Sully. Uh, the first officer, this is really interesting, 49 years old, that's not overly interesting, but A320, 737 and Fokker 100, 15,600 hours on type. So an experienced uh, first officer. Um, but the really interesting thing here, the really interesting thing uh, is that he was very new to type. At the time of the incident, he had 37 hours on the A320. He had his line check only a week before the incident, literally a week. And his LPC was on the 31st of December. Now this happened on January the 15th. So he, he, he literally done his LPC a couple of weeks before this uh, incident and had done his uh, line check only uh, only a week prior. So look guys, for all those that are newly qualified, um, this is the deal. You know, you, this could happen to you, God forbid, uh, within uh, a few weeks of you actually uh, coming on the line, just like it did uh, for this uh, first officer. So I think, I think a really uh, important uh, takeaway there when we're looking at uh, how the crew interacted and using excuse me and using uh, their experience okay so uh, let's have a look then uh, to read the executive summer january the 15th 2009 about 1527 eastern standard time the us airways flight 1549 and airbus industry 320 november 106 uniform sierra experienced an almost almost complete loss of thrust in both engines after encountering a flock of birds and was subsequently ditched on the Hudson River, about 8.5 miles from LaGuardia Airport, 
New York City, New York. The flight was en route to Charlotte Douglas International Airport in uh, North Carolina and had departed uh, LaGuardia about two minutes before the in-flight event occurred. This whole thing took around six minutes. Um, so they hit the birds after two minutes and then four minutes later they were in the river. Um, the 150 passengers including a lap held child um, and five crew members evacuated the airplane via the forward and overwing exits. One flight attendant and four passengers were seriously injured um, and the airplane was substantially damaged. The uh, scheduled domestic passenger flight was operating under the provisions of Code 14 FAA Regulations Part 121 on instrument flight rules and flight plan. Uh, the visual uh, meteorological conditions prevailed at the time of the accident, so it's a nice day out, apart from the birds. Um, all 150 uh, passengers, seven crew survived. Only five serious injuries. Uh, and what the, I guess the FAA define as serious injuries is anybody that's hospitalized for greater than 48 hours. Quite remarkable. I mean, it really is remarkable. Um, that uh, the, 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 the success of the outcome of this 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 event. The National Transportation Safety Board (NTSB) determines that the probable cause of this accident was the ingestion of large birds into each engine. Large birds, uh, which resulted in almost total loss of thrust in both engines and the subsequent ditching on the Hudson River, contributing to the fuselage uh, damage and resulting. Um, unavailability of the aircraft aft slides that was uh, one contribution was a fuselage damage uh, the federal aviation administration approval of the ditching certification without determining whether a pilot could attain a ditching parameters without engine thrust well they just don't do it do they and uh, the lack of industry flight crew training and guidance on ditching techniques and the captain's resulting difficulty in his in uh, maintaining his intended airspeed on final approach due to the task saturation resulting from the emergency situation which was all to do with him being able to maintain a uh, green dot uh, which uh, which we'll talk about uh, later on so number of factors uh, involved in there contributing to the survivability of the accident was one the decision making of the flight crew and their crew resource management during the accident sequence, which I've mentioned already. Two, the fortuitous uh, use of the aeroplane that was equipped for extended overwater flight, even though it wasn't uh, required. Um, and three, the performance of the cabin crew whilst expediting the evacuation of the aeroplane. And four, uh, the proximity of the emergency responders. So, yeah. Um, it's a teamwork, isn't it? You know, it's teamwork makes the dream work, as they say. So the safety issues discussed in this report relate to the following. In-flight engine diagnosis, engine bird ingestion certificate testing, which is an important one we'll come on to later on, emergency and abnormal checklist design, dual engine failure and ditching training, and the effects of the flight envelope limitations and aeroplane response to pilot inputs. Um, then it goes on to immersion protection and life vest stowage and retrieval etc which probably not going to go into uh to be honest in a great uh, deal of um detail but it is interesting um uh, the number of passengers who actually listened to the briefing and who actually took a life jacket considering uh, they were on water uh, like i say this this report is available so if, if you want to know more about that um then by all means um Take, take a look at it um, if you're cabin crew or ex-cabin crew uh, and, and that thing and that, that that area as a particular interest to you then of course um, you can uh, you can read that um, so uh, what shall I uh, start with next the accident flight was the last flight of a four trip sequence for the flight and the cabin crew members and the second flight of the day in the accident uh, aeroplanes. So they obviously picked this aircraft up to then take it on to their last flight. It obviously come in with a previous crew. The flight crew flew from Pittsburgh uh, International, uh, 
Pennsylvania to uh, Charles Charlotte Charlotte Douglas International on a different airplane and then flew the accident airplane um, from uh, Charlotte uh, Douglas to LaGuardia. Forgive me if you're from this area of the woods you'll know exactly what this is. My pronunciation probably isn't fantastic. The flight crew reported that the flight uh, from Charlotte Douglas International to LaGuardia uh, was uneventful. Certainly less eventful than the subsequent flight. According to the copy of Vice Recorder transcript 1524-54, the LaGuardia Air Traffic Control Tower cleared the flight for takeoff on runway four. At this time, the first officer was the pilot flying, the captain was the pilot monitoring, and uh, initial portion of the climb was uneventful. Take note of these times, uh, guys and girls. Take off the ditching was six minutes. And that is really quick. It's taken me that just to read this initial initial couple of paragraphs. So it just gives you an idea of just how quick this is. And in fact, when, I, when I'm reading this, I often feel that my, my heart rate's elevated and I almost read it more quickly as it's happening. Um, you, so you can imagine what that what they uh, would be going through. At 15.25.45, the LaGuardia air traffic controller instructed the flight crew to contact New York Terminal Radar Approach, which is LaGuardia Departure Control. The captain then contacted Departure Control at 15.25. Uh, 51 about a minute later advising them that the airplane was at 700 feet and climbing to 5,000 feet the control then instructed the flight to climb and maintain 15,000 feet and the captain then acknowledged the instruction so this is all about a minute after takeoff according to the CVR transcript at 1527.10 the captain said birds one second later the CVR recorded the sound of thumps and thuds, followed by a shuddering sound. According to the FDR data, the bird encountered uh, the uh, sorry the bird encounter occurred when the aeroplane was at an altitude of two thousand eight hundred and eighteen feet above ground level, and the distance about four point five miles northwest of the approach end of runway 22 at LaGuardia. Now, I'll put the air traffic control radar trace up here if I haven't already, just to give you an idea of the sort of the geography. So 1527.13, about two and a half minutes after the takeoff, a sound similar to a decrease in engine noise or frequency began on the CVR recording. FDR data indicated that immediately after the bird encounter, both engines, fan and core, that's N1 and N2 respectively, speed started to decelerate. Now it says in the report here, C-section XYZ, for more information about the airplane's performance during the accident uh, sequence. It's just worth just having a, a little recap here because obviously I, I've read this on and I've, I've made a, a couple of notes here. Um, but the takeoff was at approximately 85% uh, N1. That was the N1 thrust setting for flex temperature takeoff for the aircraft. Um, so that's worth noting at this point because when they do the testing for bird ingestion, they have the engine's RPM at 100%. And that's, that's quite important when we took a, take a look at that later. And when the uh, bird strike occurred, when the engines rolled back, engine number one, uh, was at 35% N1 and engine number two was at 15% uh, N1. So this was this is important to remember when we're looking at electrical power availability and hydraulic uh, power availability because to get electrical power, the the IDGs need about 50, 55% uh, N2. So. That's unlikely to, to be there, and we'll see what happened uh, later on. But there is a chance that they still had um, a, a hydraulic power at that point because the hydraulics will work as long as the engine is rotating. It might not develop 3000 psi, but it will develop something. And you can actually see this on your engine starts. The, the hydraulics come up very, very quickly, and on the rundowns, they stay at 3000 psi for the a large part of the, of the rundown. So, 
what I want you to take away from here is engine one was at 35, engine two was at 15. They had a, a source of electric, of, of a source of hydraulic power, um, uh, but they wouldn't necessarily have had enough for the IDGs to operate, which is why the uh, APU coming online was critically uh, important. Anyway, jumping ahead. Uh, not like me, of course. So uh, about three minutes later, at 15, 27, 14, the first officer staff stated, uh-oh, uh, which I don't think is SOP, um, followed by the captain stating, we got one roll, both of them rolling back. And at 15, 27, 18, the cockpit area microphone, the cam, uh, recorded the beginning of the rumbling sound, um, probably vibration as well. And at 15, 27, 19, the captain stated, engine ignition start. And about two seconds later, I'm starting the APU, uh, which was a... Um, a, a, a large uh, a, a large part of the success of the outcome of this um, and at 15 27 uh, 23 the captain took over control of the airplane having started the APU and stated my aircraft um, so to have the presence of mind really in starting the APU uh, uh, ensured that the aircraft then with the power rundown was then uh, both AC1 and AC2 were powered. It meant you could have um, the uh, blue electric pump uh, operating as well, as well as the aircraft being in normal law. So, like, like I say, um, a huge part of the, uh, of the 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 success of the result of this of the outcome of this um, this event. At 152728, the captain instructed the first officer to get the QRH. Uh, quick reference handbook. Loss of thrust on both engines. It's an enormous uh, checklist which they had no hope of, of getting all the way through. And at 15, 27, 33, the captain reported emergency situation to LaGuardia um, departure controller stating, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is Cactus 15, 39. Um, hit birds. We've lost thrust on both engines and we're turning back uh, towards uh, LaGuardia Airport. Of course, it was 15, 49 was the flight number, but we can excuse him uh, that misdemeanor. Um, <clears throat> we're turning back towards LaGuardia. The LaGuardia departure controller acknowledged the captain's statement and then instructed him to turn left heading 220 degrees. Now in the footnotes here it says that the air traffic controller didn't actually hear the mayday 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 because it was uh, trodden on by another uh, aircraft but he heard obviously the subsequent uh, transmission. Um, interestingly, when you look at the radar trace here, when they instructed uh, 1549 to turn uh, onto a heading of 220, it put them straight down uh, the uh, Hudson, which, um, well, they they needed some good luck at least, didn't they? It was the longest wet runway I think that they had available or would likely to ever see. 152750, the first officer began conducting part one. Uh, of the QRH dual engine failure checklist, uh, engine dual failure checklist stating, if you're remaining, engine mode selector, ignition, uh, which is what he commenced and did. The captain responded, ignition. The first officer then stated, thrust levers confirm idle. The captain then responded, idle. About four seconds later, the first officer stated, airspeed optimum relight, 300 knots. We don't have that. And the captain responded, we don't. Now, this would have been the first time that this uh, first officer would have looked at this checklist, uh, probably. I'm not too sure what was involved in ZFT training, if that's what they went through, given his experience uh, in, in the sim. Uh, but I dare say, if it wasn't the first time, it was probably the second time. And um, I can imagine that would have been, uh, well, first he found it fairly quickly, uh, which which was part one of the rule. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I, I can, you know, familiarity with it, you know, just just wouldn't have been there. Um, so anyway, we don't. 300 knots relates to the windmill start speed. The APU is not available at this time. When you look at the timeline, the APU has only been on for about uh, 30 seconds or selected about 30 seconds ago. So it won't have been uh, up and running at this point. A 152805 required departure control asked the captain if he wanted to try and land at a runway 13 uh, at LaGuardia, which would have been a further left turn to bring him on, uh, in on 13. The captain responded, we're unable. 
we may end up in the uh, Hudson River. So this is less than four minutes now after takeoff. They're facing straight down the eye of the Hudson River, looking around thinking, I'm not going to be able to make that. It looks like we're going straight in the river. The first officer stated emergency electrical power, emergency generator not online, and a 1528.19 about, um, what was that? Uh, 14, about 10 seconds later, let's say, the captain stated it's online. The first officer stated air traffic uh, control. Oh, so I'll come on to that in a second. Um, the APU was not online at this time and only um, approximately one minute after starting. So with the N2s being less than 55%, so it's likely that the um, um, generators uh, won't have been online um, and uh, the rat did deploy and uh, was actually found with the blades intact deployed as part of the um, uh, when when they recovered when they recovered the aircraft so yeah so, so the, the point is here the rat came out it wasn't originally online and then some seconds later it came online as expected because it takes a few seconds doesn't it? it takes about eight seconds to deploy and then come online when it realizes that both ac buses one and two are not powered and the apu hasn't started yet um so yeah that would have started on uh, batteries likely and was taking its time to run up the rat came out and then uh, came uh, online, which then gave them the AC and DC uh, essential buses. Shortly after that, of course, the APU uh, then came online. So the first officer then stated air traffic control uh, notify and a 1528 to 25. The captain stated um, the left one, the engine's coming back up a little bit because if this was... Um, I think engine number one was, uh, what have I got here, 35%, and engine number two was down at 15%, so it was running uh, slightly uh, slightly higher uh, M1s. Um, so 152831, LaGuardia controller stated that it was going to be left traffic for runway um, 31. Uh, anyway, uh, maybe too much information, but anyway, the captain responded unable, uh, 152836. The uh, traffic collision avoidance system, TCAS, on the aircraft transmitted traffic traffic. This was all to do with a helicopter uh, that was uh, operating nearby. Um, at 1528.46, the controller stated that runway 4 at LaGuardia was available and the captain responded, I'm not sure we can make any runway. Uh, what's over to our right? Um, yeah, what's over uh, to our right in New Jersey, maybe Teterboro. Uh, this was one of the airports that the subsequent simulation tests uh, looked at in terms of uh, um, making a decision as to whether or not some of these airports were actually available uh, at the time. We'll come on to that a little bit later on. The controller replied, OK, yeah, off to your right hand side is Teterboro Airport. Subsequently, the departure of control asked the captain if he wanted to try and go to Teterboro, and the captain replied yes at that point. Now, 15, uh, 28, 45, some 15 seconds later, while the captain was communicating with ATC, the first officer stated FAC, which is, the, you know, the flight augmentation computer, off then on to get the characteristic speeds back. 15 seconds later, the first officer stated no relight. Well, it, you know, it's not going to relight at this point, likely because the optimum relight speed is uh, 300 knots. Because what else can he do? He's going through a checklist of a dual engine failure. There's nothing else he can really do. Uh, so you might be thinking, uh, well, why didn't they use the APU bleed? Well, we know that even if they had tried the APU bleed, these engines weren't going to start. But when you have a look at uh, the appendix here, which I'll try and include uh, the US Airways dual engine failure checklist, the APU bleed is over the page and two thirds of the way down um, uh, before they even get to that. So this, this this was over and the APU starting itself isn't until much later on in the checklist. And then subsequently after the engine starts, the APU bleed comes on uh, below uh, flight level 200. So yeah, that was never gonna happen. Um, and in following this checklist. So lots and lots of really good uh, stuff that's come from this now subsequently, which uh, we'll talk about uh, a little later. No relight after 30 seconds, engine master one and two confirm. Uh, and then uh, the captain announced the public PA system. This is the captain brace for impact. 
1529, uh, 14, the CVR recorded the ground proximity warning system alert, 1000, and 1529, 16, the first officer stated, engine master two back on, and the captain responded back on. You see the communication that's going on there during this highly stressful event. Yes, the, the, the flight deck kind of separates a little bit. Here, the, the captain's really busy flying the aeroplane. Um, and the, the first officer's very busy with a very long and complex checklist. But see how they're coming together with the communication. And I always say communication runs in the DNA of all failure management and, and keeping that line of communication going and saying appropriate things at appropriate times um, is, is so vitally important uh, to... Um, uh, to the workload management and the CRM communication in the flight deck. Um, so the checklist, if no ray really light off 30 seconds, then back on. Um, um, there's just there's just no time for this, is there really? I mean, it, it, it's it's a, I wouldn't say a pointless exercise. I've got to try and restart the engines, but you know you can see where this aircraft has moved uh, in 30 seconds. So. Uh, so 1529, 21, the CBR recorded the LaGuardia departure controller instructing the captain to turn right uh, 280 degrees and stating that the airplane could land on runway one at uh, Teterborough. At the same time, the CBR recorded the first officer asking the captain, is that all the power you've got uh, on number one? Um, or uh, we got power on number one. In the response to the controller, the captain stated, we can't do it. Um, in response to the first off, the captain said, go ahead, try relighting number one. The FDR data indicated the engine master switch one was moved from the off position at 1529. The departure controller then asked the captain which runway at Teterborough he would like. He responded, we're going in the Hudson. Yeah, so 1529.36, the first officer stated, I put it, that's the engine master switch, uh, back on. And the captain replied, OK, put it back on. And at 1529.44, the first officer stated, no relight. The captain replied, OK, let's go. Put the flaps out. Put the flaps out. A 1529.53, LaGuardia controller stated that he lost uh, radar con contact with the airplane, uh, but he continued trying to communicate with the captain, stating, you also got Newark Airport off to your two o'clock in about seven miles. And I'll show you the, 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 there isn't the airport on here, unfortunately. It just shows the airplane touched down LaGuardia and, uh, and the bird strike. So when the, when, the, when the captain asks uh, for put the flaps out, put the flaps out, the aircraft at this point with the generators, sorry, with the APU uh, online, the um, hydraulic power is restored because we've got, I would suggest, um, likely we've got green and there's a possibility we've got yellow, but green backs up the yellow in any case. So I know we've got uh, flaps and of course we've got slats uh, because the AC bus one is powering, I think it's AC bus one from memory, is powering the um, is powering the blue electric pump. So we've got slats and uh, we've got flaps. So trying to communicate with the captain stating you also got Newark off to your right, two o'clock, seven miles. Um, and see figure one for the track of the aeroplane. Not much information there for you, I'm afraid. 1530-01, the first officer stated, got flaps out. And at 15.30.03 stated 250 feet in the air. He then stated 170 knots, got no power on either one. Try the other one. The captain responded, try the other one. 15.30.16, the first officer stated 150 knots. And at 15.37, 15.30.17 stated got flaps too, you want more? The captain replied, no, let's stay at two and then ask the first officer, got any ideas? And the first officer responded, actually not. Um, so this also shows us that the, the first officer is still trying to start the engines um, at 200 feet. You know, they've not given up on this. A 1530, uh, 1530, 24, um, the GPWS terrain, terrain warning, followed by pull up, which repeated to the end of the CVR recording, which was at 1530.38. And the first officer 
stated switch. The captain replied, yes. And at 15.30.41, the GPW issued a 50 uh, foot warning and the CVR recording ended at 15.30.43. The captain stated, we're gonna brace. So 15.30.43, and when all this started at 15.24.54. Uh, so it definitely took me longer to read that than the actual events took place. So uh, quite scary. Within seconds after ditching the Hudson River, the crew members and passengers initiated an evacuation and the airplane subsequently, all of the occupants were evacuated from the airplane and rescued by area responders. Figure two shows the airplane, the occupants on the wings and the aircraft slide and rafts uh, after the evacuation. So pretty extraordinary here so no fatalities um five serious injuries 95 minor injuries and obviously uh, nobody died a total of 155 all walked off uh, the airplane which is um which is quite uh, quite extraordinary um okay so i'm gonna finish it there because i think that's a nice way to start um We've had a look at the event, we've gone through the timeline, um, we've looked at some of the factors and I've made references to some of the uh, topics that we're gonna talk about uh, later on. So hopefully now you've got an idea of the event if you haven't heard of it before. Um, I haven't had a chance to take a look at this report and you've got an idea of uh, some of the topics uh, that we're gonna cover. Uh, later on so I don't know when I'm going to do the next one now like I say it's no rush we've got lots of other things uh, to talk about and um, and uh, I'll see you again with the next episode when we can do it so take care everybody fly safe keep the plates spinning and I'll look forward to seeing you again on another episode of Airbus what's it doing now whatever that might be in the near future thanks very much